Yes, my name is Gev Albino. I'm here introdu- interviewing a gentleman by the name of Dr. Batum. Batum. Dr. Batum, a, a, a former Lincoln student, a Lincoln alumni currently. Right. At his, in his home, in his lovely home here in Media, Pennsylvania. And what we'll be discussing is Dr. Batum's life experiences, his whole life in general, in this brief moment. Thank you. Um, I'm... Dr. Percy Bateps. I was born and raised in media. I went to school locally here in media, graduated from media high school, and then attended Lincoln University for four years, then went to Howard University to medical school, took an internship for two years, and then started practicing medicine in the city of Chester. And I practiced there for about 50 years. So currently I'm retired and still working one day a week in a clinic in Chester. Um, Dr. Dr. Beta, what I would like to ask you right now is, where did your life begin? Where was Dr. Beta's first, where did, where did you originate from? Media, Pennsylvania? Yes. I was born and raised here. My father, <clears throat> considering the times, was a, was a relatively well-educated individual. He, had, he was... Um, uh, very interested in the church and uh, also a lot of ancillary activities uh, surrounding the church. He he was the superintendent of the Sunday school. He was director of the choir. He was head of the um, junior church. He had uh, written a book and published a book of poetry and uh, was helped one of the co-founders of the local NAACP in media, which did a lot of work in helping to in embracing de- desegrega- desegregation. And so at a very young age, uh, my father and both my father and mother instilled in us that an education was an important thing. And uh, we grew up, uh, there were five of us, and each one of us grew up, even though it was uh, the Depression years, we grew up knowing that we were going to go to college. Didn't know how we were going to pay for it, but we knew we were going to go to college. And all five of us graduated from college, and um, my, uh, I had a younger brother, and I went on to medical school so there were two of us that became doctors, two became school teachers, and my brother Don went to medical school for one year, but he didn't like it, so he dropped out and <clears throat> took some uh, extra training in environmentalism and worked for the state as a state environmentalist. So that's basically the history of uh, the I wonder, how did you manage to overcome all this adversity associated with with segregation in, in that particular era. Well, my father, as I said, was very. He f- helped to find found the NAACP because of the racial tension that existed in media. And uh, we had a theater in uh, a movies and the and movie the moving picture theater in media, where they segregated us. They put us down on the little section in the front row. Um, which was typical of of what they would do with blacks in that particular era. Um, all the theaters in this area would have segregated sections for blacks. Same as in the South. The South would put you up in the balcony down at what they called the peanut gallery. But <clears throat> my father was opposed, very opposed to to segregation in all its spaces. He had some cohorts in uh, some Quakers who lived in media who were very, very instrumental in in helping to shape the um, the destiny of black people in the community here. And uh, it was, you said, how did you cope? You sort of swallowed your pride. There were a lot of things that happened to us that we did not like and didn't appreciate. Uh, my father told us uh, once uh, they, uh, 
after they had passed a what they call the Equal Rights Rights Bill in Pennsylvania, he said, "Now you can go down to the movies and you can sit any place you want." But that wasn't a fact. You would go down there, and if you sat out of the little black section, the usher would come and ask you to move. But my father cautioned us, "Don't say anything." It was sort of a the early sit-ins. Yes. So we just sat silently there. So you were an active participant in the, um, in the early sit-ins and the young black movement towards the, towards um, segregation. That's right. Yeah, and uh, there were uh, several things. There were several. There were a couple of restaurants around that would segregate us, and um, my father, the NAACP, took them to court. Although the court did not rule in their favor, but they they knew we were around anyway. Um, there was <clears throat> a segregated school in the lower section of media called Lower Providence mm -hmm. and um, that's where most of the black people lived and they had a little one room school there that my father hated and he and the NAACP raised such a fuss that they closed the school down and because of that, all of us went to integrated schools. I I went to an integrated school all of my life. So how was that transition from going to a segregated school to an integrated school? How did that affect you individually as a person? Well, I was in an integrated school all of my life. Okay. We lived, we happened to live in this section of media where there were very few blacks. So it wasn't economically sound for the schools to segregate us. We, they, we, they had to include us. As a matter of fact, I was the only black in the first grade. And there were two blacks, and when I got to the second grade in school, there were two blacks. By the time we got to the fifth grade, then all the blacks in the other end of media who were going to the segregated school were transferred up to the school in Upper Providence and so by the fifth grade, we had pretty well integrated school. But by virtue of the work that my father did with the NACP in closing that segregated school, you had more blacks. We always went to, a, to an integrated school from that point on. And how was life in these integrated schools? How was life for you as an individual? As an individual, I didn't, didn't notice it didn't notice um, any overt racism. Uh, I, was, I think that I was treated very fair. We were very, treated very fairly. Um, I can recall that we gave a school play, and I think it was uh, Alice in Wonderland, and I was given the part as a king okay. and uh, sat alongside of a white queen. Um, it was in high school where, <clears throat> after going pu through puberty, when really racial segregation starts to raise its ugly head, because the whites didn't want you integrating with their their Female. white daughters and yeah. so forth and so on. So it <clears throat> it was um, still a very subtle thing. But you, 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 you knew it. You knew it was there. You felt it there. And just as, as today, you can feel when, uh, when people are uncomfortable, white people are uncomfortable around you, or you're uncomfortable around right white people. And that's the way it was uh, then. We, <clears throat> in our senior year, we took a, a um, school trip to Washington, D.C., we all went down on the same bus. We sat where we wanted to on the bus. We got to Baltimore and went to the <clears throat> Lord Baltimore Hotel. I don't think it exists today for lunch. So <clears throat> we all went up to a big auditorium and 
sitting mingled around there until they got ready to serve the lunch. And our um, counselor came and told us, went to each of the blacks and said, well, you have to go downstairs to eat. So we went down and they put us in, had a table set up for us. We had to go out of the hotel, around to the back, in the back door. And they had a table set up for us in the kitchen. We refused to eat there. And <clears throat> because of that, they put us on <laughs> a big Greyhound bus and sent us to the black neighborhood in Baltimore so that we could have a little dignity when we ate our lunch. And then when we got to Washington, we knew that the sick hotels, the accommodations were going to be segregated there because they told us ahead of time that it was a law that you could not, blacks could not stay in a white hotel. Excuse me, I don't mean to cut you off. So it seems to me that if you, you and your 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 cohorts back in, in in your in your era, sort of were rebellious to some degree even then. Oh yes. Were yes. you as active during the civil rights movement? Pardon? Were you as active during the civil rights movement? No, during the civil rights movement, uh, I was um, in practice in Chester. Um, I contributed, but I had a lot of work, to, a lot of patience to see, so I was not able to to contribute as much. But my sons were very active in it. Did you and, encourage that behavior? Yes. Yes. They... Um, and and they went be greatly beyond the call of duty. I think <laughs> as one of my sons got got his nose broken in the uh, race riot down in uh, in Cambridge, Maryland. He was going to Howard at the time, as if he was a freshman there, and went out on this sit-in over in Cambridge, and, and there was a racial riot there. So he was in the mix of that. So. They were my kids. The two oldest boys were very active in the movement. It's, I'm kind. Of, I'm sort of impressed by the way you. You seem to be so calm and collected about your experiences. However, how does how did how did how do your experiences did, did your experience in in a sense affect your whole your whole life from past to present? Well, I don't. I don't feel as though that that. I experienced the harshest of segregation as a lot of people in the South, in the Deep South did, or people who came up under different circumstances. And I, I came up in an integrated neighborhood. We, there, we, we, there are a few black families in this block, the rest were white. So all my life had been sort of in an integrated atmosphere. There was certainly uh, a very deep-seated resentment of the way that I was treated a lot of times and the way that my race was treated. So um, how did I cope? I coped just like just about every every other black individual. You, you, you had to do it because it was, a lot of times it was the law, but a lot of times it was custom. And my father used to say, that, and I wish it certainly wish that he had lived long enough to see have seen what Martin Luther King did. He used to say that it's going to take time, and we're going to have to take little steps. But when Martin Luther King came along, so far as I'm concerned, he made us take giant steps ahead, and uh, he is my hero as he is. Hero of, of of all blacks, I think. And do you think there will ever be another individual that can carry on the the the, the baggage, the racial baggage, like such as Martin Luther King and many others? To have somebody as charismatic and as eloquent as Martin Luther King, there there might be and there probably will be another one but i think that that individual is a long time from the scene i i'm 
don't see anybody around currently that could even touch his charisma, his eloquence, his ability to to enunciate a point with such color. And I, I haven't I haven't I haven't seen anybody around yet that that is equal to that, but I don't. Uh, that's not to say that that there isn't a Martin Luther King. I might be sitting right next to him right now. Maybe. <laughs> and what what is your take on the present generation? Do you think the present generation kind of feels wants to rely wants to remember what happened in the past, or do you think they just for, want, would rather forget about it? I, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm rather disappointed in uh, the present generation, especially black males. Um, they don't see the need or necessity of going to college, most of them. I think that you know that is much better than I do. In the communities where you grow up, how many of the kids, what percentage of kids would you say black boy, young black men aspire or even want to go to college? Small number. It's a very small number. So I'm very disappointed in that because I feel as though that that they could do young black men can do so much for the race. Young black women are taken off. They're in they're going to school and they're in businesses and they're become heads of of uh, corporations, etc. And although we have some black men, we don't have enough to to be that role model and I'm I'm extremely proud of you for, for for going in that direction of getting an education. So do you think that the present generation needs to reflect what happened in the past in order to move forward in the present? I think that they have to understand the need the absolute need for an education. And I don't think that they re particularly realize that that that's the reason why you go, they talk about unemployment being down now, and it is. But if you go to a McDonald's, which is minimum wage, minimum wage you'll see nothing but black people working there most of the time. Yeah. And most of your fast food places, minimum wage, your car washes, etc. So all young black men working there. Why? Because they don't have the educational background to get anything better than that. And that's sad. That's very sad to me. So you're saying the, education is the key? It is the key. It's absolutely the key. There's no doubt in my mind about that. It's a key that's going to open the door to, to everything you aspire for. However, would you also agree with me by saying um, that, that education is the key, however, an individual has to reach back and pull another person up. Oh, that's, uh, I, yeah, I, yes. It, 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 it probably is. Um, germane. It's germane to the parents to reach back. I think, just as my parents did, instilled in us, as I told you before, we were poor. We were dirt poor. We slept we had one room that we that we occupied in the winter because the rest of that although we lived in this uh, eight room house it was my grandmother's house but we when when it got cold the whole house was closed down so that we had to live in one room eight played in the kitchen because it was cold because it was so cold, we would have um, we would have heat in the house on Christmas Day and for New Year's, and that was it. In the summertime, you would burn up because it was so hot in there. But I say that to say this: that to show you that how poor we were. My father and my mother still instilled in us. You go to school and you learn. And that is what I think 
is the job of every parent. And when you say should reach should we reach back? Yes, we should reach back. But the parents should take a role in instilling in their children that it's not impossible to be dirt poor and go to school too. I did it. We did it. Um, I can recall at Lincoln, and they had a very liberal um, payment schedule out there. Um, that you 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 paid your tuition, uh, you could get a state scholarship. I don't know whether they still exist now, but you get a scholarship from the state that paid your tuition. Yeah. But you would have to pay for your books, and your room and your board. That's when I went there. And it was a difficult thing for my father to get together the money to pay for the room and board. But you would promise that you would pay before the end of the semester and they would let you slide. Consequently, when it got to my senior year, I owed about $300 and they weren't going to let me graduate until my father paid this bill. Well, I told you about the Quakers that lived in me. He he went to one of the, the Quaker friends and asked them to loan him the money. And he borrowed the money and um, paid my tuition so that I was able to graduate. That is a commitment of parents and to, to do everything you possibly can for your kids. And he... Um, he never paid this man back, and I paid him back after I started practicing. I had found out that my dad hadn't paid him back, so I paid him back with a little interest, and he was a little happy about that. But we we do have to reach back and help bring others along. But I think that it should, again, that it should be instilled upon parents that they have an important role to play so in... Do you, excuse me. Do you feel that? Do you feel that the, that the parents are the actual role models in, in within the family? Unfortunately, no. In the black community, no. And by and large, the the, the parents are not the role model. Or well, should be. They should be. They definitely should be. But uh, a lot of times, the parents are worse than the kids. Yeah. So. It's. I feel this way very definitely that you, once you get your education and you find that you come out in the world and the sky is the limit and you have a family, you're going to be very, very thoughtful of what you should do to support your children. That's a good parent to make your children's life better than yours was. That's what my parents did. They made my life better than theirs. I made my children's lives better than mine, much better than mine. And that's that's the role of a parent to do that. That's not something that you can do if you <coughs> if you think about it. It's something that you must do. Absolutely. Okay, well, it seems to me like you have, uh, you had a, a, a kind of a, a wonderful life, sort of. I'm serious. It's, it's been a wonderful life. You know, you, you come from the of, uh, a era in which black people were African Americans, were, have had to face uh, a, 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 an array of adversities. And it seems to me like you overcome every last one of those adversities. I mean, you, you're, a, you're currently a doctor. And you practice medicine for X amount of years. How many years? Almost 50, 45 years. 45 years yeah. as a doctor? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that you, you've sort of overcome a, a lot in your life. What, what would you like to tell people in general? How, to, how, do, how would you want to encourage people to, to, to be successful in life or to overcome their personal adversity? Because everyone in life has their own personal adversity. How, how does one overcome adversity? Well... I think um, I 
cannot thank my parents enough for the sacrifices that they made for not just me, but for all four of my brothers and sisters. They made tremendous sacrifices for us. But they had a goal. They had a mission. They felt as though they didn't make it, but their kids are going to make it. And what I feel very good about is that I carried this mission on through my family. I have three boys. All three of them are physicians. All three of them never gave me a minute's trouble. All three of them are very successful. One is a neurologist in Washington, D.C. The other one's a urologist in Washington. And the youngest boy is a radiologist out in Detroit. I'm extremely proud of them and what they've accomplished. And not only that, have they, they are doing much better by their children than I ever could have done by them. So it'll sort of be a domino effect. Right? It is. It is. They had, just this past year, my oldest son, daughter, son's daughter graduated with honors from Columbia University. My middle son's oldest son graduated from the University of Washington, uh, a University of Oregon, no, University of Washington in Tacoma, Washington. And I went to their graduations and I was very proud of them and to see what they, they have done. Their parents uh, sent them to private schools from day one, which I was never able to do. My kids went to public school. But we were out in this area here where the school, they have good public schools. So I was very fortunate in that respect. But down in Washington, they felt the need to send their kids to private schools, and they went to private schools, and it paid off. They excelled when they got to college. If there's one word that would, that you can say that can capitalize your, your entire life, that can highlight your entire life, what would that word be? Success? Well, of course there had to be success, but uh, another word, a word other than that. Lucky. Lucky. I, was been very, I have been very, very lucky. I've been lucky to have accomplished as much as I have accomplished in my own personal life. I feel lucky that I had three kids that I had no trouble with when they were growing up, going through their teenage years. I feel lucky that I have the family, the extended family that I have. I'm lucky. I'm a very lucky man. I'm sure you are. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to wrap this up. Talking to, um, it's been great talking to Dr. Batebs. Batebs. My name is Gav Albino. Thank you very much. Bye, you bye, Lady Cannon. Yeah, you bye, Lady Cannon. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. okay. <laughs> Well, there there were some other questions you didn't, did, that you didn't uh, touch on. Uh, some other areas you, you didn't touch want, on. Can we? No, I, I can make suggestions now. It's too late now. But uh, uh, he mentioned that he was lucky, but uh, I was wondering whether he noticed uh, one thing that occurred when people saw that you were trying to do something. There was always someone that would step in and help you out. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that was true. You... you had a, that that was the thing that I suppose I didn't uh, emphasize as much as I should. That support system. That's what I was saying about parents being more sensitive to their children's needs when encouraging them to go to school. But as you pointed out, sometimes the parents are worse than the kids. Do you remember uh, Sugarman's uh, Meat Market in, in media? Yeah. And that was one of the things that, um, you mean years ago? Yeah, right. They had a, a meat market on State Street. Yeah, and they 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 accused a, a black boy of raping a girl from Elwyn. Oh, no, Is I don't that remember that. No, I don't remember that. I was speaking in terms of Sugarman's, uh, uh, the meat market, uh, the way we used to go in and buy meat. Uh, they had a bag uh, they would give us for a dollar, 
They had all the tripe, the chitlins, all the mall, trotters uh, because of the, the, the uh, ears and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. And that, those, yeah. were, those were the ways that we survived. I tell my kids that story mm -hmm. I tell, because that was the one thing that I, I, I've always had a lot of pride. I can recall two incidents to illustrate what I'm saying. My father was cleaning up the backyard one day, and he put a whole lot, a barrel full, we filled a wheelbarrow full of trash. And I couldn't have been more than 10 or 12 years old at the time. And he told me to wheel this down the street to a trash dump that we had down there. And I told him, I said, Dad, this is beneath my dignity to do that. Well, he, he didn't, he didn't, punished me, he cracked up laughing because I said it that. That was one of the things. The other thing was during the Depression, he would, the only time my mother and he would fight or fuss, was he would leave a dollar for her to get groceries with. And the minute he would come home and come in the house, he would say, Mom, where's my change? Now he had five kids to feed and two adults. <laughs> She, she would say, what change? But she sent me with that dollar down to this market, that he, the, one of the markets that he was talking about, and you would go down there, and I would humiliate myself by saying, give me a dollar's worth of leftovers. Mm -hmm. I hated that. Mm -hmm. Just as much as I hated wheeling that wheelbarrow some trash. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, this is a pride that that I had, I didn't deserve to have that pride because I didn't have anything to back it up with, but that's just the way I felt. I was humiliated as that man for a dollar's worth of leftovers to feed my family. Oh, yeah. <coughs> you used to get bread, leftover bread. Yep. The acne, the bread was real hard and crusty. But uh, I, I often tell him and some other students how a fall dime when I see the way kids throw food away in the cafeteria. The food is like anything else, you know. I mean, it's, it's even when it's bad, it's good. It gives you life, but they don't see a lot, a lot of times they don't see food as uh, in terms of life. Right. They see food as a uh, some something they would just uh, as soon get away, get get away, get rid of, you know. There, there, there's a, uh, another thing that I was thinking about too, and that was, you've heard about the Great Depression. Yeah. And the Great Depression, the, 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 there was, was certainly a certain equalizer about it. The difference between now and then was during the Depression, most everybody was poor, white and black. And they, their white kids were in, in much tatters as we were. Today, most of the black or a lot of blacks still live below the poverty line. And when they're, they're in the midst of, they can look around and see the affluence all around them. This is the difference between your generation and my generation. It was easier to take for me because everybody else was in the same boat. And I, I think this is probably the reason why you find so much crime among young black people, men. Uh, they see all this affluence around them. They don't have the wherewithal to get this legitimately. So they sit out robbing somebody or holding somebody up to get it. It's a sad story, but I think that, that that illustrates the difference between the, the two eras. Because during the Depression, everybody was poor. Now, it's segments of the population that are poor. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on the uh, political uh, uh, picture in media? It was predominantly Republican, right? And even though Roosevelt was Democrat, uh, we had still had to go to the Republicans for uh, the WPA and things of that nature. Well, that still holds true for Delaware County mm -hmm. uh, as a as a whole. Mm -hmm. Delaware County, I'm I, I'm non I registered nonpartisan in because I didn't feel as though 
that I'm going to be asking anybody for any political favors. I got my MD degree. I could do with that what I wanted to do, so I would not really beholden to anybody. But the politics of this county, this this uh, community, this county, has always been re Republican, and has always been been ruled by a, a political boss. Um, they not so overtly today as it used to be, because there was one guy's name that you would name him McClure. You remember his oh, yeah. McClure? You 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 mentioned his name next to God because he controlled everything in Delaware County, everything. If if. The school teacher, if if you were black and wanted to teach in the black school system down in Chester, you with all the qualifications you had, you had to get that job through him, and you paid patronage back to him. I don't think that exists today, but that's that was the politics of uh, of the era, and I thought he was referring to one time during my father's youth. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Elwin Training School. Do you see the signs as you pass by on yeah. Route 1? Mm -hmm. uh, it was an institution for mentally retarded children. And there was a young white girl who was belonged to that institution, was raped. And they came into media and picked up... Uh, some young black man and accused him of this rape. They didn't, uh, from what I understand, there were no warrants for his arrest or anything. And that's when my father and uh, uh, two other gentlemen in media became so incensed with this injustice that they were the ones that said, that's when they set up out to form the NAACP. And um, they fought this um, case and eventually had the young man freed of the charges. That's interesting because uh, in a left-handed way, I was accused of a similar uh, uh, situation when I was overseas. I was on Iwo Jima. I have been on Iwo Jima almost a year. Mm -hmm. And someone got raped in media. And uh, they paraded all the young youngsters up to look like me. Or I, and uh, and uh, they uh, weren't identified, so my uh, my mom was told by the uh, chief of police that uh, I hear you have another son, and my mom said, "Yeah, but you won't be able to get him." So uh, my mom showed him the picture, and he said, that, "And, and uh, from what I understand, I was positively identified as a racist." And that's when they, my mom cracked up. He's been overseas for over a year. <laughs> so, that, that, that showed lot. you how smart they were. Yeah, that was, uh, that was very interesting. My dad, he, he almost cracked up. This but um, when I told you about that, it reminds me of you, me telling you about the segregation down here at the media movies. Mm -hmm. When my father told us, you don't go down there. If you, if you don't sit where you want to sit, well, I'm not going to permit you to go. So we sat right in the middle of the, of the white section, and they would come and ask us to move with, we would, he, as he instructed us, wouldn't say a word. Now, my brother went down there once without me, and he sat in the white section. So the usher came to ask him to move. He didn't move. They brought the manager of the theater down, shining the light in his flashlight, asked him to move. He didn't say anything. They got the, went out and got the chief of police and brought him into the theater. And the chief of police grabbed my brother by the car and took him to the police station. Well, that was too much for debate. <laughs> my father and my mother were down to that police station, nothing flat. And my mother, we laugh about this today. She went up to the chief of police and she was pointing her finger right in his face. She said, how dare you to arrest my son? Said, if it had been a criminal in a back alley someplace, you would have been hiding under a trash can. <laughs> Was that Chandler? 
Chandler. Chandler. Yeah, Chandler. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he said, watch what you say, madam. Mm -hmm. But she didn't was, back off. Right, his daughter was in school with me in class. Uh, what name was, I think her name was Dolores. Is that right? Dolores, yeah. oh, that's who it was. It was mm -hmm. Chandler. Chandler. Yeah. Then after him, it was Lowhead. Yeah. Lowhead was the next uh, state trooper. And he ruled the place with an iron fist, I guess. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Huh? What, what, what church did you go to in the... Trinity. Trinity? Where's that? The AME or what? The Trinity UAME Church. U, okay. Well, it wasn't the UAME the, oh, the, then, was it? Yes. It was, the, it was they, always. They, they oh, were always united? The yeah, church? United Methodist oh, Episcopal Church. Yeah. I thought that was a new, uh, uh, how was it, a new designation. And now, that's, no, that's, mm -hmm. we belong to a conference mm -hmm. of, uh, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, um, mm -hmm. Honeycomb was a UAME church. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it still is or not. Mm -hmm. Out in Lima, mm -hmm. you know, right by Pencrest there, mm -hmm. that old school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there is, um, there was a UAME church that belonged to our conference in Chester. Mm -hmm. You remember where Bethel Court used oh, to be? Oh, yeah, yeah. You want to tell them about Bethel Court? <laughs> we, 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 there was a U Trinity, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a church, UAME church, right in the heart of Bethel Court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He doesn't, know, he doesn't know anything about Bethel Court. Oh, Bethel Court. Court in Chester during the Depression. Well, Chester was quite an industrial center at one time. Shipyard, right? Had the shipyard, had Congolium Rug, had Scott Vapor, had um, Ford. Ford Motor. Um, it was highly industrialized. And it was an industrial center. And so, and plus the fact it was a port. So, cargo ships would come in with their crews and so forth and so on. So wherever you have transient traffic, you're gonna have prostitution. So the prostitutes lived in a section in Chester called Bethel Court, and everybody knew <laughs> the minute you meant Bethel Bethel Court, you knew 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 that that was the area of the prostitutes. Yeah, that was four square blocks, wasn't it? Four square yeah. blocks, red, red light district. Yeah. Jack Farrell had a, a club there. Had a club there, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. I remember during World War II, they had the, all the windows painted black because of uh, the blackout. Yeah. But they still flourished, though. There were, uh, uh, not quite a few, but there was, there was quite, a, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, numbers activity around here. As a matter of fact, I won't call the person's name, but he was very prominent in the, uh, in uh, what the uh, so social uh, circle. Oh yeah, anybody that that made money was mm -hmm. in the black community was was oh, yeah. the social elite. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> it was interesting, but they they they, they uh, I think that if they were born today or with this generation, they would all be geniuses practically. Yeah. Because uh, some of them didn't even carry the the, paper, the little book around. They memorized the numbers. Yeah. And they would bring, if you hit the numbers, they'd bring your money in a little brown bag. Yeah. <laughs> Four dollars on a penny, wasn't it? If you want to hit the numbers, you know. Yeah. Four dollars. Family, you know the Bowser family? Bowser's, yes. Well, Mr. Bowser used to make all the wine. Yeah. And, uh, and the guys wanted to steal his wine, but they went, went, they went in the backyard one day, and they, uh, uh, Took the, the what was it, the cheesecloth off of the uh, wine, and he saw it was about one inch of maggots on top of the wine, and they all tried, to, they tried to go and throw them, yeah. but they wanted to steal his wine. Yeah. Then, then my uncle said he was going, uh, go, was going to go back there and take the wine too, and and Mr. Bowser had a corn cob pipe, and and the man drooled, and the drool was running down in the wine. <laughs> oh, Mr. McCarran, he said he didn't want any more Mr. Bowser's wine. <laughs> That's like a joke my father used to tell. Oh, yeah. He said yeah, that was, um, this minister went to this lady's house, and she was making bread. And I don't know what you've, you've never seen anybody make bread. Well, they could take the dough, and they knead it, mm -hmm. and keep doing this until it's well mixed, you know, and so forth. So she was kneading the bread, and she had a head cold, and she, while she was leaning over, it dropped was right on the tip of her nose. Mm -hmm. So she said, said, Reverend, said, won't you stay for some hot rolls? <laughs> and said, said, Reverend looked at it and said, sister, it all depends where the drop falls. <laughs> Man, 
man, but they, they used to have some good food at those churches, didn't they? Yes, Ooh, it did. Man, don't mention it. Those hot rolls, those rolls are about that high, right? Yeah, that's right. Homemade butter. They look like loaves of bread. Yeah. The rolls. Yeah, boy, they were good. But I'm wondering what what role did the the, the black churches have in the communities? It didn't have the. It it did not have the social. Uh, it was a social outlet. Most of the churches were, just. Um, how would I put it? It was a meeting place, like historically black churches had been. Yeah. Uh, but they did not take part, participate in community life as they do today, which I think is the rightful place for, for, the, for the church to do. But they weren't, they, they would let you hold the NAACP meetings the at the various churches because they didn't have any place else to meet. But the minister never took a lead and say, we're going to demonstrate or something like that 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 just didn't occur <clears throat> yeah, the other thing is the the source of income for the minister is what the, like my grandfather was a minister and he also had to garden and do other odd jobs and things oh like yeah that. and uh, so sometimes I, I guess they were a little fearful about speaking out in those areas yeah because their source of income would be lost the other thing I noticed is uh they used to take up a collection for the kids who were in school, college, et cetera, you know. They got a few pennies from us, but uh, there was some help, you know. But Ma, she went to school uh, at uh, the Cheney, Cheney. I don't know whether you knew her, Josephine, she made this. Well, she was Josephine. Yeah, Ross. yeah. And uh, she went to uh, 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 Cheney, and uh, they had all kinds of money, uh, trouble getting the money together for school. And uh, it, uh, I forget what the tuition was, but it was only a... It, was it like, wasn't a pittance to what it is now. Yeah. Money, yeah. But she had a rough time. My uncle used to drive in from Philadelphia to help out. Well, it, it was, you know, the tuitions mm -hmm. were at, at historically black schools wasn't high at all. I think mm -hmm. at Lincoln it was $400 for a semester. But that was like... Four thousand dollars at that at that particular time. That was a lot of money. When you can, when you consider, I would go out and work all day long and cut grass in the neighborhoods around and get twenty five cents an hour. I'd work work eight hours and come home with two dollars. And uh, the thing that I hated about that was my father, as soon as he knew you had some money, mm -hmm. he would ask to borrow it. Mm -hmm. Well, you knew <laughs> when he borrowed your money, you were not going to get it back. <laughs> so we made the mistake, my brother and I, of loaning it to him one time, and then asking for it, had the nerve to ask him for the money back. He said, well, I fed and clothed you all week, had my So that meant you weren't going to get your money back. <laughs> so after that, we never had any money. <laughs> That was a lot of money. We get uh, yeah. a dime for shoveling snow. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we walk around with a snow shovel. We pray for snow. And I remember uh, going out to Lincoln and after between my freshman and sophomore year, or sophomore and junior year, right before, right during the time the war broke out. I guess that was my senior year, between my uh, junior and senior year. When they opened up Sip Sunship, mm -hmm. And I went down there and worked for the summer, and they were offering 85 cents an hour. I thought that was a mint of money. <laughs> and it went up to a dollar? And yeah. it went up to a dollar? Yeah, it was something else. I remember my dad uh, made $1,000 one year. My mom was just uh, making all kinds of accolades. $1,000 a year. Yeah. $17 a week he got later on. And uh, and uh, what was it? And our, our rent was $15 a month. And we still had a rough time making ends meet. Just yeah. Like you were talking about. Well, my my father made eighteen dollars a week where he worked, and he was a carpenter by trade. He went to a trade school, and he took up a shop, and he was a carpenter by trade. But by the time the depression hit, nobody was building houses, nobody was renovating anything, so he got a job working in Wanamaker's in the men's room there and you know how they pay the when people come in and wash their hands he's there 
with a white coat on and hands him a towel, and they get a whatever, didn't get the tip. So at the most, he was made eighteen twenty dollars a week, and he had five kids, and two of us were in college at the same time. My sister was going to Cheney, and I was going to Lincoln. <laughs> now, how I ever did it, I don't know, but, but they, mean, they we managed somehow or another to do it. Yeah. It was one, one of those things I noticed about media. We were almost like one big family. You know? That's very, very true. Yeah. You had to be careful who you talk to because you'd be talking about somebody's family. Yeah. <laughs> like the Masons and the Petty Johns. <laughs> They were uh, related, to, and who was it? Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, the Brookses, all of them. Uh, Moats. Moats. All of them are interrelated. The Moats and media. <laughs> and, uh, Moats still got a big family in oh, media, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, um, I'm, I'm trying to corner Arthur Rich uh, Jr. to get him to submit for, uh, to an interview. And uh, it's, it's like trying to, to you know, pull his teeth right now. Is that right? Right. Because uh, could you tell him a little bit about Arthur Rich? Do you remember Arthur Rich? His father? Right, uh-huh. I know a little about his father. His father was a, a chauffeur for a, a wealthy man who lived in Rose Valley. Mm -hmm. Ro media is surrounded by wealthy communities. Rose Valley, uh, Wallingford, uh, we're in Upper Province here, but other... Another province? Uh, another province, yeah. Okay, yeah, Bowling Green, right down. The Bowling street. Green, right. yeah, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so it's it was surrounded by wealthy people. Plus the fact that this was a county seat, and you had the po the courthouse here, so you had a lot of lawyers living in the area. So anyway, Arthur Rich, the father of this young man who lives out near Cheney now. Um, his father um, worked for this wealthy man and he there was a they had a repertory theater in Moylan I don't know whether you've ever heard of it not, called Hedgerow Theater no. well, a repertory theater is where they have a play a couple of plays that they will play one play now and then they'll do, go to another play and then another play and then they'll start repeating it. So it's a repertory theater. I don't know whether you've ever heard of the play by, uh, who wrote that? Eugene O'Neill, mm -hmm. I think, called Emperor Jones. Yeah. And it's about a black man who um, is... I forget the story of that myself. He was from Haiti, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he finds out that he he is of royalty. I don't know all the the story, but he mm -hmm. he it's the only black. He was the only black in the cast, mm -hmm. so they got and it was a leading role. So he was picked, a very talented man. Although he was a chauffeur, with this rich white man down there. He excelled in this role as Emperor Jones, and he was noted for that role. And you talk about um, the respect in the community, he was highly respected in the black community as mm -hmm. one of our leading actors. Heroes. Although he was the only one. You know. But anything you accomplished, I, like like he was saying, you if you were a successful number writer and you made some money, you made an impact in the community. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, yeah. and, and today now you play numbers uh, at the state level. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He also played the uh, part of Othello too, didn't he? I don't. You, he might have. Uh, I know. I know. Uh, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the role that he was most noted for was Emperor Jones. But um, were you born and raised in West Philadelphia? No, actually in um, Angola. Angola? Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. How long have you been in this country? Your parents come here? Yes. You were born here? Yes. No, I was born there, but I came here like a, when I was somewhere around one year old, so I've been here 20 years. Uh -huh. 
Do you know much about your homeland? Yeah, um, currently it's, it's a country that's been engaged in civil war for, for 27 years. 20 years. Yes. Yeah. Castro was supporting yeah, it there Castro, for a long time. Castro, the Chinese, the Americans, all the superpower basically. So it's been, it's, 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 the country is basically destroyed right now. Can't go back anymore. Yeah. Because of its strategic location. Yes, not, not only that, but the wealth that's in the country. The, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot, of, like, like, a lot of the African countries with the wealth that they have, and they've been exploited since time and memorial for so that everybody's grasping now that that they have independence everybody's grasping for that power and you know in neglecting in my opinion the people um a vicious circle the whites took over and decimated them and then they left and then a few blacks who have a little education, have gotten in the position of authority and don't want to go out and let it go. No. The current president has been the president for, I think, 27 years yeah. throughout the entire Civil War. So President for life. Yeah. Billionaire for life. Yeah. So. I, I said that with tongue-in-cheek because uh, in Haiti there was... Um, Oh, what was the guy's name? Papa Doc. Huh? Papa Doc. Papa Doc. He was president for life, <laughs> which meant they ain't going to make no elections here. <laughs> Devalier. Right. Then the son came out. Who was it? Baby Doc? Yeah, Baby Doc. <laughs> well, they got rid of him, though. Mm -hmm. But they have been at odds since then. They, 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 they can't get their act together now, man. There's two classes, very poor and very rich. Yeah. No middle class at all. And I would think that's the way it is in Angola. Yeah. Or most of your African countries. Yeah. You got the, the very rich and the very poor. And everyone's clashing to get the wealth. Right. As we close, I'm wondering, what would you like to, what kind, what, what kind of legacy would you like to leave behind for your great, great grandchildren, your future descendants from now? Well, I think, uh, I think they, the legacy is fairly well established, in my opinion. I have provided my kids with the, the right tools to, to face the future, and I think that um, has rubbed off on them, and that has rubbed off on their children. And I sure I I feel that their children will 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 carry that legacy on. So I I think that that we as a family are constantly motivated to do better. And I'm hopeful that that is the legacy that I leave to my uh uh descendants that they'll they'll be motivated to do better there's always room for improvement never be content with anything that's right okay. thank you very much i've learned a lot from you just by talking to you and i'm sure that i hope that i can apply everything that you've told me in my everyday life experiences so i can somehow possibly in the near future become successful at whatever it is I'm striving for, to be successful at. Thank you very much. Well, you're quite welcome. And I would like sometime uh, for you to come back. Sometime during the time that um, uh, we have a family get together, when we, it's amazing and amusing for everybody to have a little story to tell about what has happened. <laughs> To them, and I particularly miss my my middle bro my uh, older brother. And I'm the oldest of the three boys, but he and I grew up together, and we we had some extraordinary stories to tell. That we would tell one story and crack up, and then that would remind me of a story, and I would tell tell that. 
my brother would be out on the floor. He would just be rolling and laughing. But the, that sort of a legacy is, is, is being carried on because the kids, my grandkids still come. They come here and all they're, they're graduated from college. They want, at Christmas time, they want to see stockings hung at that fireplace out there with their names on it. <laughs> So that's it's just a family tradition. So I hope sometimes you can come back and visit.